heaven that this God has no rival, has no comparison, has no parallel. There is none like him, the incomparable God in heaven. And then number three, the infinite greatness of the Most High. That's what we're looking at today in the study. Number one, the impotent gods of the heathen. Number two, the incomparable God in heaven. And then number three, the infinite greatness of the Most High. Let's look at number one. Number one, the impotent gods of the heathen. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 14. Daniel 3, verse 14. And let us see what he mentioned and what he said about his gods in the plural. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3, verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do ye not worship my gods, my gods, and not worship the golden image which I have set up here? He referred to his gods, but how mighty, how powerful, how significant are those gods? They were nothing because they couldn't deliver the people from the fire. The gods of Nebuchadnezzar were of his own making, but our God is our maker. What a difference. Man is powerless, and the God he makes and worships is impotent, powerless, and worthless. Man is vain, and his idol God is vanity. Indeed, those idols are lighter and less than vanity. The most mighty men that were in his army who bound Shadrach, Peshach, and Abednego, and threw them into the furnace of fire, were burnt to death by the flame of the fire of the furnace. The gods of Babylon could not deliver the idol worshippers. The gods of the heathen cannot save. The gods of the heathen cannot deliver from earthly torment or eternal torment. The worldly dignity of all idolaters will be consumed in the flame of divine wrath and there will be none to rescue or deliver them from God's judgment. In fact, idolatry is foolish. God will convince all of us now and eternity of the folly of worshipping gods, the gods that cannot save, the gods can, that cannot help, the gods that cannot deliver. Idolatry is an abomination to the Almighty God, and the idols and their worshippers shall be destroyed from the earth. The great creator will not accommodate or tolerate such abomination against his honor, against his majesty, and against his glory. Look at verse 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Where are their gods? They were not there to deliver. But in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the God of heaven was there to deliver them in the hour of trial. Let's see what the Bible says about the gods of the heathen, the gods of the pagans, the gods of the people that do not know the true God. In Isaiah chapter 45, Isaiah chapter 45, what do you mean from verse 20? Isaiah 45, verse 20, assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray to a God that cannot save. A God that cannot do what? That cannot save. They don't have any knowledge. They don't have any understanding. They don't have any wisdom. They do not have any revelation. The people that pray to a God that cannot save, that's the God of the heathen, the God that is impotent, the God that is powerless, and a God that cannot save, that cannot help, that cannot deliver. In Jeremiah chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Here is the word that the Lord Almighty God himself is declaring to you and to me. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. What that is saying is there are heathen people, they want to know the future. 
and they look at the heavens, they look at the stars, and they're watching the horoscopes. But the Lord is saying, don't you do that. It's worthless. It's confusing. Because the gods of the heathen that they are appealing to through those horoscopes, they deceive. And it is not real. It says in verse 3, for the custom of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workman with the axe, they deck each with silver and with gold. They fasting each for the nails and the hammers that it move not. They are upright as a palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, be carriage, be lifted up, because they cannot go by themselves. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is each in them to do good. It's talking about the idols of the idol worshippers. Cannot do good and cannot do evil, but we have a God in heaven who is always doing good. And that God of heaven will do good to your soul and even to your life in Jesus' name. It says, abandon the worthless idols of the people and then submit yourself unto the God of heaven. In Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 11, thus shall ye say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. It's telling us that those idols, they've not done anything good. They have not created the universe. They have not created the earth or the heavens. Why are you paying any attention to them? Pay attention to God. He is the God of heaven and is above all gods. In Psalm 115, Psalm 115, I'm reading from verse 3. It again describes for us the impotent, worthless, useless idols of the world, gods of the world. It says in Psalm 115, verse 3, But a God is in the heavens. Where is your God? In the sea, on the land, in the forest, in the shrine. No, it says, but our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he has pleased. Their idols are silver and gold. The work of men's hands. They have, no, they have mouths, but, cannot, they, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but cannot see. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses they have, but they smell not. They have hands, but... They handle not, feet have they, but they walk not, neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusted in them. And that's the kind of God that the Nebuchadnezzar trusted. The gods of Nebuchadnezzar and the idols of all the heathen people on earth are words of man's hand. That's what we're told in verse 4. They, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. In as much as the maker is always greater than the thing that he has made, these idols are less than the artificers, that is, the people that fashion them. It is evident that such a man-made God, a man-made idol, is no God. Can there be any more? Uh, can there be any more absurdity than that? That somebody is asking for assistance from them, from the people, from the idols that have no strength, that have no power. It says uh, these people they don't have any portion of divinity in them, any portion of divine power in them, and the idols they may cannot have any portion of divinity of divine power in them. All idols and all gods, whether they are silver or gold, whether they are wood or stone, whether they riches or pleasure, all those gods and idols are impotent. Am I right? They are worthless. Is that right? In the hour of need, they have no eyes to pity. They have no ears to hear. They have no tongue to counsel. They have no hand to help. An idol, a God that has eyes but cannot see, is blind, is a blind deity. He must be very blind indeed who worships a blind God. 
We pity a blind man, but how strange it is to worship a blind image. Nebuchadnezzar's image could not tell who its worshippers were, and could not protect its worshippers, nor punish those who refuse to worship. That's what we are told here, that all these idols are nothing. We are not going to worship any idol. We are going to remain with the true and the faithful and the almighty God who is able to deliver. Let me show you an encounter with one of these idols of the land. In 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Reading from verse 1. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer, from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Now that Dagon was their god. It was their idol. I'm going to read verse 4, but I'm going to read first uh, verse 7. So you will see that the Dagon they are referring to was their god, not my god. I said not my god. My own god is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is in heaven. And he does great and marvelous things. But in their own case, the Philistines, their idol, their god was Dagon. Look at verse 7. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is so upon us and upon Dagon our God. That was their god. Dagon, that was their god. But let's see the encounter here in verse 3 now. And when day of Ashdod arose early, in the, early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was falling upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. The gods of this world will fall before the Lord. They will be destroyed. Their power will not stand and will not hold in Jesus' name. And he took Dagon, they had to carry him, he didn't have any power of his own. And he took Dagon and set him in his place again. Verse 4, and when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was falling upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon, both the palms of his hand, were caught up upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Just the presence of the ark of God in that place that they are taking from the uh, opening and finial, the sons of Eli. Just the presence of that ark destroyed and broke in pieces that Dagon. Doesn't that show you how mighty our God is? If the ark, not even God himself, the ark of God, a representation of God, if that will make the Dagon to fall down, and the head off, and the hands off, and everything up, only the storm remaining, our God must be mighty and powerful. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon, nor any that come into Dagon's house, thread, thread on the, th on the, th on the, th on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day, but the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod. And then it says, And he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is so upon us and upon Dagon our God. Our God in heaven is so great and mighty. And no power can withstand him. That's why the Lord is challenging us. Come away from any trust, any confidence in the idols of the land. And trust in the God of heaven. I will be well with you in Jesus' name. In Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. Verse 12. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go. And cry unto the God's small g, the idols, unto whom they have offered incense. But they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. That's the calamity of the people that trust in idols. In the time of trouble, in the time of tribulation, in the time of suffering, in the time of affliction. 
when they cry to those gods and those idols, they will not be able to deliver them. It says in verse 13, For according to the number of the cities where thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have you set up altars to that shameful sin, even the altars to burn incense or to build. Therefore pray not thou for these people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them. For I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. God was saying, let them cry to their gods. They have been worshipping idols. When they get into trouble, I will not hear them. And I'm not going to answer any prayer on their behalf. I want them to prove the impotency of their gods and the insufficiency of their gods and the worthlessness of their gods. What are we to do then? We're to abandon those idols and we're to make sure that we put our heart, our life on the Lord God alone and our God will deliver us. Acts of the Apostles chapter 19. Acts of the Apostles chapter 19. We're reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 19. We're looking at verse 18. 18 as well as verse 19 and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds and it says in verse 19 and many of them also which used curious as brought their books together and they counted the uh, brought their books together and burnt them before all men and they counted the price of them and found a 50,000 pieces of silver. What that is saying is that those who are worshipping idols before. And how they came to know the Lord. All their books, all their clothes, all their regalia, all the things they used in worshipping the idols. And all the idols themselves, they brought everything together and they bound them so that they can rely on the God of heaven alone. Because God is able to bear your body. It's able to remove your mountain. It's able to carry your load. It's able to solve all the problems of your life. We don't need any of those idols, any of those gods. Burn them, get rid of them, dispose of them. We can depend on God and God will see us through. I said God will see us through. His power will not fail. His promises will not fail. His promises are yes and amen in Christ. Those idols mean nothing. Those idols can do nothing. But our God, the God of heaven, He is the one that is able to deliver. He will deliver us in Jesus' name. And if you have anybody around you still bowing down to idol and still worshipping idol, why don't you show them the light of the word of God and the revelation that those idols, they mean nothing. Those idols will amount to nothing. That we are standing in the strength of the Lord, in the power of the Lord. And as we stand with the Lord, the promises of God will work mightily in our lives in Jesus' name. And now, but you must serve God and serve Him alone. Not God and an idol, not God and another thing. God and God alone must be your confidence. And if God and God alone is your confidence, then He will see you through in every challenge of life in Jesus' name. I come to point number two, the incomparable God in heaven. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3, verse 29. Daniel chapter 3. We're looking at verse 29. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be caught in pieces, and their houses shall be made a don't heal, because, because there is no other God. Everybody, can you say that with me? There is no other God. That can deliver after this sort. That shows us how incomparable our God is to any God in this world, any God of the earth. He tells us in the Word of God that this God, there's nobody, there's no other God like Him. I want you to look at Psalm 89. Psalm 89. We're looking at verses 5 through 9. Psalm 89. 